who was a former tight end at Miami of Ohio. He has been on staff with AIA for about 10 years. And uh, fun fact was he's on week five of P90X. He's lost three pounds. So give it up for Chris, Chris Spreistall. P90X, baby. Has anybody's dad done P90X in here? Or your mom? You got two dads? Any moms? Your mom, sweet. Has anyone in here done P90X? Oh, you guys are college athletes. This is beyond P90X. You guys know what X stands for? Extreme. Extreme, yes. If you're really into it, you do this like, you know. So if you see me walking around campus, and I'm like, what's that? Or a little piss. <laughs> Is that a good dab or what? My kid, my kids are trying to teach me. Is that pretty good? Not too bad. Yeah. My daughter was joking around. Like, she was trying to figure out like how they like someone figured out a dab. And you know the way sometimes you blow your nose and your. And she was like, someone probably did this, and they sneezed, and that actually turned into the dab. It was pretty cool. So, anyway, that's my daughter. Well, hey. Uh, Actually, I need my little pointer. What did I do with that? The clicker. Right there. Right here. Where is it? Oh, right here. Right where I left it. All right. Um, well, hey. We are continuing our series this semester called Redeeming Culture. Some of you here uh, were here last semester. You heard some of the talks. Uh, we're basically addressing issues of how does the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, impact issues that we deal with in our culture. And so last semester we talked about um, issues that are going on in our culture like human trafficking, leadership, death, uh, how the gospel influences our mind and emotions and why we should take this message of Jesus Christ to the world. And we finished with Natasha had a message on redeeming Christmas. And so um, that was last semester. For this semester we're going to start the first five weeks dialing in and focusing on one area that's that's in need of being redeemed and that is sport sport is in need of the redeeming influence of jesus christ sport needs to be redeemed because you and i we live in a broken world we live in a broken world because this world is filled with broken people and um, um even though sport is a beautiful thing i love sport do you guys love your sports are they awesome? I mean, I love watching sports. There's so many great things about it. But even though sport is beautiful, it's awesome, it's great to experience and watch and see the amazing things that athletes can do, uh, it's broken in many ways. And um, it's broken because broken people play sports, bo broken people coach sports, broken people manage sports teams, universities, national uh, and international leagues. And so we see the effects. I'm not going to go into all kinds of details about the effects that we see of brokenness, but I want to show a video that, in, that shows you or illustrates one of the ways that we see the brokenness of sport in our world. So go ahead. Any soccer players in here? Two. Three? Was there a little hand raised? <laughs> Check this out. Women's soccer, BYU, New Mexico, semis of the Mountain West Conference Tournament. This has some MMA qualities to it. BYU free kick, Cassidy Shumway hands it to Carly Payne. In the net it goes. BYU takes a one zip lead, Payne's 13th of the season. That's New Mexico defender Elizabeth Lambert. Uh, some questionable plays throughout this game. Here Payne and Lambert fighting for positional level and then a punch in the back. Lambert here fighting for Shumway. Not for the days. Keep going on. You know, there's physical. There's rough, you see, and then, and then on occasion, there might be just downright unsporty, and uh, right about here where Lambert drives Shumway and, and down, oh. there's really fouling. Where's the line of this kind of rough play, please? Sure, there is jostling off the ball. That's part of the game of soccer, and in the women's game, there's even some pair pulling, yes. But, oh my goodness, if you're going to pull someone's body down without snap their head off with it, that is going over the line. See, that's from a gold medalist, so I trust her in that. 77 minute watch as Lambert goes in for the hard charge. Trips the BYU player. Ball gets kicked into her face. That one's going to get her a yellow card. And she challenged her up on that more rough. So as they get over there, you see some swings taken both ways. BYU wins at 1 0. BYU at one point, though, they went up to her and they just said, look at the scoreboard. We're ahead. 
one nothing. They will play the conference championship on Saturday in San Diego State. There you have it. Aren't you glad you guys don't have ponytails? <laughs> <laughs> now some of those, you know, they're just being aggressive. I think that's okay, but pulling the ponytail. I mean, that was unbelievable. Could you imagine? Has it ever happened in, in gymnastics? <laughs> like she just she nails something and you go out and pull a ponytail because you're losing or something like that. So brokenness, brokenness affects how we play our sport. Brokenness affects how we deal with winning and losing. Does anybody here watch the UFC? Does anyone know Ronda Rousey? Ronda Rousey, you guys know Ronda Rousey. Even if you don't watch it, most people probably know who she is. Um, brokenness affects how we deal with winning and losing. When R Ronda Rousey lost the title weight bout a little over a year ago to Holly Holm, uh, she was in an interview, and here's what she said after she had lost that title weight bout. She said, I was literally sitting there and thinking about killing myself, and that ex exact second, I'm like, I'm nothing. What do I do anymore? And no one gives a shit about me anymore without this. That's how she felt. She felt like killing, and I'm sorry if I offended anybody. S word, it's not too bad, but hey, um, that's what she said. You gotta get the effect, no, no bleeps in here. Brokenness affects how we deal with winning and losing. Brokenness affects our motivation, how we view ourselves, how we treat our teammates, coaches, managers, opponents. It affects every aspect of sport. But just because sport is broken in many different ways, it doesn't mean it's beyond redemption. Jesus is in the business of, of redeeming every broken part of this world. And that includes sport. That includes sport. He died for broken people. He died for athletes. And he wants you and I to experience life and our sport the way it was originally intended to be experienced. So for the next five weeks, we're going to dial in and focus on uh, these five principles that Athletes in Action has developed over 40 years ago and have, has refined for these last 40 years. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what these are. Thanks, Michael. It would be easier for you just to do it. Uh, so the, these five principles are this. Number one, audience of one. Who or what do I worship? That's what we're going to tackle today. Principle two is maximum motivation. What motivates me? The scriptures have a lot to say about our motivation, why we should do things, right motivations and bad motivations. The third principle is going to be holy sweat, holy surrender, which talks about how do I grow? How do I become the kind of athlete and person that God wants me to be? Principle five, hurting for certain. How do I deal with pain and suffering? Just because you might call yourself a follower of Christ doesn't mean you're immune to pain and suffering. It's part of a broken world. God has something to say about it. And number five is victory beyond competition, which is how do I live for God's kingdom instead of my own? Is there some bigger narrative unfolding in this world that's bigger than Ohio State, that's bigger than your sport, that's bigger than your life? The simple answer to that is yes, there is. That's what we're going to talk about in principle number five. So, you guys ready to get this thing rolling? Yeah. You guys ready to learn a little bit about how God's word applies to your sport? Okay, so audience of one, who or what do I worship? Now, here's the main point or the main thing I kind of want you guys to wrestle with here in regards to the question, who or what do I worship? And it's simply this, everyone is a worshiper. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be religious. Everybody is a worshiper. We all worship something or someone it's the way god created us we're all wired this way and what i want to suggest to you guys here tonight is this that unbeknownst to you most of you in this room probably worship your sport in some form or fashion you're relating to your sport in a way that you were originally designed to relate to god and it's creating all kinds of frustration and disappointment for you okay you don't even know about it most of you are worshiping it in some way or something else. Something else that's very important to you. You're relating it, you're relating to it in a way that you're only created to relate to God. You see, the way you think about your sport, the way you think about yourself in relation to your sport, the decisions that you make in relation to your sport, how you invest your time, how your sport affects your emotions actually betrays the fact that you're worshiping it. Okay, so we're going to unpack that. So what I want to do to try to unpack that is this. Uh, you're ahead of me. I'm just going to put this thing down. Um, I want to give you a couple working definitions. I really believe worship is kind of like a diamond. You can look at it from a lot of different angles. 
I'm going to give you two definitions that I think are pretty good that describe from a biblical perspective what worship is. The first definition is this. Worship, and there are, uh, you guys have notes there if you guys want to take notes. The, these things here at every place. I'd encourage it. Here's what I want to encourage you guys to do. Take notes. Write some of this stuff down. Pay attention to what stands out to you because here's the bottom line. We're just going to scratch the surface today. In order for this to settle into your heart and for you to become the kind of person you need to become, that God wants you to be, you need to think about this. You need to process it. We take this principle and we take five days and deal with it at our camps in Puerto Rico and Colorado and all over the U.S. So I don't expect you to get everything here today, but by taking notes, you'll be able to come back and reflect on it. So number one, worship definition number one, it's ascribing ultimate worth or value to someone or something which results in serving that someone or something with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. So most of us attach value to things. We attach some sort of value, but worship is about attributing ultimate value, saying, hey, I've got to have that thing, and if I don't have that thing, I'm not going to be satisfied. And so we put everything into it. Another worship definition I want you to think about is this. Number two is putting your ultimate trust or hope and whatever you believe holds the promise for a future of happy tomorrows. Now, some people might not like the word happy. If you don't like the word happy, throw in the word blessed. Putting your ultimate trust. The issue is trust and hope. Where is it? I know for me, when I was, I didn't know Christ when I uh, was playing football at my university. I remember showing up there and all my hope for a future of happy tomorrows was in football. I couldn't wait for that day that I was first team All-American Conference, that I was an All-American tight end that we won the conference, we went to a bowl game, and eventually I ended up playing in the NFL. That was my, those were my goals, that's where my hope was. And as long as I was moving in that direction, I thought, my life has meaning, my life has purpose. Or once I attain to those things, then I'll be happy. Does that make sense? So we need to all think about where is our hope? Where is your trust? What are you putting your confidence in that you say, hey, if I have that, then I'll be happy? What is that thing? What is that thing? And so, if we're honest, I think, for many of us, our sport isn't just a game anymore. It has become life. It's the focal point of everything that we do. Now, here's the problem. 16th century theology professor, Martin Luther, put it this way. He said, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. So what does your heart cling to? It's an issue of the heart. It's like, hey man, I gotta have that. If I don't have that, then I don't have anything. That's your God, that's what he's saying, okay? So if your heart is ultimately clinging to your sport or some goals or dreams or aspirations or you fill in the blank, that's your God. If by your attitudes and actions you're ascribing ultimate worth or value to your sport, you're worshiping your sport. If you're putting all of your, your, your ultimate trust and hope in your sport for a future of happy tomorrows, you're worshiping your sport. That's what you're doing. Now, here's what I want you to understand, just a little side note here. We can worship anything. It doesn't have, just have to be your sport. You can worship a relationship. You can worship money. You can worship pleasure. You can worship gadgets. You can worship a career. You can worship your kids. Anything, you fill in the blank. It's the way God wired us, but we were never meant to worship the creation. We were created to worship the creator. But sin takes that desire in all of us and twists it, and we start to worship the wrong things. So when we do that, we worship anything other than God. We're guilty of a sin in the Bible that's called idolatry. So what is idolatry, or what is an idol? An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you only what God can give, that is what I, that's what an idol is. And that's a definition from Tim Keller. He's a pastor out in New York area. He writes a book called Counterfeit Gods. So an idol is anything that's more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Think about that. Think about that. So we're created to worship God but we substitute all these different things for God. This problem isn't just our problem. It's a problem that has existed from the first day that Adam and Eve chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
We substitute all kinds of things for God. This problem is spoken about all throughout Scripture, from Genesis, the very beginning, to Revelation, the last book. It deals with our hearts. And so in order to unpack and understand a little bit more about what does it mean to you know, worship God, who or what do I worship, playing for an audience of one, we're going to look at a story from uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 40. I've got the verses we're going to throw up here on the board. Not, not, not yet, though. Um, but I'm going to give you the backstory. In this passage, there's a, it's the story of Elijah, who's, who's God's prophet. He's a spokesperson for God. And the prophets of a false god, an idol, a substitute for God named Baal. And so here's the backstory to the story that we're going to read. There's been a drought in the land of Israel for the last three years. So it hasn't rained. Imagine what that would be like. It hasn't rained for three years. So the people of God, who are called to worship God and Him alone, have begun to worship another god named Baal, who was a fertility god or a rain god. There were other nations that worshipped this god, and they thought, man, if we just start worshipping this god, maybe he'll bring the rain. Maybe the one true god, Yahweh, that's his name in the Old Testament, maybe he's not really God, and so maybe we need to start worshipping this other god. And so God tells his prophet Elijah to have all the prophets and representatives of Baal assemble on Mount Carmel for a spiritual showdown to see who really is God. We're going to look at that story. And as it was for the people who originally lived it, this story is a confrontation between God and whatever is competing for the number one spot in your life. It's for their life and for yours. So is it sports? Is it relationships? Is it a career, money, sex, food, image, gadgets, knowledge? Whatever it might be, that's what this story is about. It's about what is competing for that number one spot in your life. So we're going to read just the first five verses, 1 Kings 18, 20 through 24. So here we go. It says, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? That's the key verse in this whole passage. How long will you go um, between limping, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, let me get back to it. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. The Lord is God, follow him, worship him, serve him, make him your God. But if he's not, then go follow Baal. And the people didn't answer him a word. They were afraid because they knew, hey, they came to a point of decision. They had to choose who were they going to worship. And Elijah said to the people, I even, I, even I only am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Imagine that, standing up to 450 people. One guy. There's one God. Worship and serve him. He stands up. He says, let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, little g, and I will call, call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He's God. The one who eats up this Sacrifice by fire, just through prayer, he's God. It says, and all the people answered it as well spoken. In other words, game on, right? <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. So, Elijah promises the people to do away with all their idols, idols and make a choice to follow the one true God. Because they're back, they're, they're going back and forth. Yahweh, Baal, Yahweh, Baal. They're half-hearted in their commitment. They lacked convictions. They weren't willing to be all in with God. We do the same thing today, don't we? When something else is more important to us than our relationship with God. We trust God to meet our needs one minute, but then when it seems like he's not coming through, what do we do? We run somewhere else. And when that doesn't seem to satisfy, we kind of come back to God and say, hey, you know what, maybe I was wrong about this. We go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But God wants us to be committed to him. You see, here, 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 here's the bottom line. Even though... We may be divided in our, in our worship. What God is essentially saying to these Israelites, and I believe what he says to people through every age, every time, is simply this. I am the only one who is ultimately worthy of your worship. I'm the only one. You can try to serve these other things, but I'm the only one 
who is worthy of your worship. I'm the only one who will ever satisfy all the desires of your heart. I'm the only one who is worthy of worship because I alone am the one who created you. I made every hair on your head all the way down to those crooked little toes, and I know everything in between, and all of you, all of your physical being, your spiritual being, your soul, your body, your mind, your emotions, they were created for me, for this relationship, to love me and serve me and know me and grow in that relationship with me, and I am the only one who ultimately will truly satisfy. God is saying, hey, I am the only one who can truly give you life and breath and all things. Think about that for a second. The Bible says that God gives life and breath and all things. Every breath that you breathe is what? A gift from God. You take a breath. He gave that to you, one after another. Think about it during a hard workout, every breath. You couldn't compete in your sport if he didn't give you the air to breathe, the lungs to breathe that air. God is saying, hey, I'm the only one who truly loves you with every ounce of my being, and I demonstrated my love so much, that's why I sent my son to die for you, to overcome your worship of false idols to bring you back to me. God wants all of us to understand that he's the only one who truly loves us. No one will love us like God. God is the one who says that, hey, I have the infinite resources to meet every one of your needs. You can look to all kinds of things to meet your needs, whether it's a relationship, sex, power, whatever. None of it will meet your needs like God, like God will. So this is the message that's in every word Every passage of the Bible, essentially, and through every age of human history. And so I think one way to kind of look at this, this problem of divided worship, is, is like this. Go to the next slide. You guys have smartphones, right? You guys got smart, that, that's a, like smartphone 1.0. It's got six apps on it. <laughs> All right? So many ways, what this, illust, this kind of illustrates, this, this is an athlete who I would say worships many gods, Okay? And when you look at it, it's almost like each app on that phone is a different area of somebody's life, okay? We kind of open up the, the sports app, we open up the family app, the, the, the money app, the friends, school, and we kind of treat God like an app as well. We just go to him when we think we need him, uh, you know, or sometimes maybe we put him on that screen a couple screens back, right? But he's just one app of many. And we open him and close him when we think we need him. That's really what it means to be divided, to not worship God as the one true God. But this is what God wants. Go to the next slide. You look at that slide, this is an athlete who worships the one true God supremely through Jesus Christ. And what's interesting, when you look at this, this phone here, you don't even see God in this illustration. You know why? Because he's the operating system. He's the operating system. You couldn't even have the apps of phone, family, social, like money, friends, school without him. That's how God wants you to see him, that he has something to say about every area of your life. He wants to be supreme. He wants you to make him the operating system. The choice is yours, okay? He doesn't want us just to kind of open them up here and there willy-nilly. And I think, you know, well, anyway, we'll move on from there. God wants to be your life. We need to let him speak into and reign supremely in every area of our lives. And so... If you want to choose to worship idols with your life, you need to know a few things about them. I want you to uh, hear what, what happens next in this story. Verses 25 to, uh, to 29. It says, Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first for you, uh, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given to them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them. Listen to him. I love this. He mocks them. He says, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself. He's like, Your God must be taking a dump. <laughs> I mean, I think that's kind of funny. God's, or yeah, your God's taking a dump. So he says, uh, da -da 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 -da. He's relieving himself or he's on a journey or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their customs with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. So here's the warning here, deceptive idols. 
Counterfeit idols don't ultimately deliver what they promise. Idols will always overpromise and underdeliver. They will always overpromise and underdeliver. Idols speak to you, your sport, family, whatever it is, it speaks to you. It does. It wants something from you. But it will always overpromise and underdeliver. And in the story, what happened when they cried out to their false god? Nothing. There was no answer. Idols are always silent. They will never answer, they will never satisfy. Listen to this quote from Tom Brady after three Super Bowl victories. He's a quarterback for the New England Patriots. He says, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I think God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, he's using God kind of like an exclamation mark. I'm not sure why, but the answer to his question is right there. He's got three Super Bowl rings and he thinks, man, there's got to be more. And you look at your life, you fill in the blank with his quote. You could say something like, why do I have fill in the blank? The hot girlfriend, the hot boyfriend, the big house, the car, everything that you ever wanted. And man, I think there's got to be more, something more for me out there. You fill in the blank. His story isn't just his story, it's our story. We all go through that. We're created to worship, but not worship anything in the creation, but worship the one true God. So what's the solution? Here's where it starts. Revolution. Declared Savior. Following Jesus changes everything. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's what he's saying. I am the way. I am the way to the Father. I am the way to the one that you were created ultimately to worship. I'm here to restore creation, to put it in its proper order, to put all these areas of your life in the proper place so that you would worship the one true God. I'm the way to God. I'm the truth. I'm the one who will teach you about every area of your life. You want to know how to live all those different areas, those different apps? Come to me. I'll show you where they fit. I'm the life. I'm the way to have eternal life now and forever. I'm the life giver, the soul filler. When you say yes to me, you begin that journey of worshiping God supremely. That's where it starts. So wherever you are on this journey, it starts with Jesus. He died to bring you back to him so that you can have this relationship with him. And then finally, what happens in the rest of the story in verses 30 through 40? We're not going to read it. I'm going to summarize it. Basically, Elijah calls all the people. He takes his, his uh, altar made of stone, throws the wood on there, throws his bull on there, gets, I don't even know, 100 gallons of water, and just dumps it all over this thing. Now, I don't know if you know anything about starting fires, but water and fire don't mix together. If you've got a piece of wood that's even just a little bit wet, it's not going to light. You can take a piece of newspaper that's dry, light it, it goes right up. You put a little bit of water on it, what's it going to do? Smoke. Nothing. It's newspaper. Water and fire don't mix. So he drenches it, and then he prays to God. And in verse 17, those verses are up here. He says, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So when they said, The Lord, He is God, what were they ultimately doing? They were surrendering. They said, Yes, You alone are God. You alone are supremely worthy of my worship, my life, my trust, my hope, my joy, my satisfaction, my everything. Who could bring fire from heaven and tear this offering up? Who could do that? Only the one true God. And so last point, response, is this. Daily surrender. We need to believe that God is supreme and worthy of our continual submission. What does this look like? Every day, it's a battle to get our mind right. Every day it's a battle to get our mind right. There's a new prayer that we need to pray. Something like, uh, it needs to change from, it's all about blank to, it's all about you, God. You wake up every day, you go to your sport, you interact in your career, whatever it might be, and you start to think about what does it mean to make God supreme in this area of my life? Not to make this area supreme, but to make God supreme in that area of our lives. As athletes, we all compete for an audience, right? We compete for the fans, parents, coaches, teammates, whatever it might be. But learning to compete for an audience of one 
for God to worship him supremely is a lifelong journey. And my prayer for you tonight is that you really think about who God is and who is worthy of your total devotion. Here's what we're going to do. For about three or four minutes, on the back side of this, I want you to get into groups of three or four. There's two questions on here. Discuss those in groups of three or four. And then these guys will come up and wrap us up.